The book of James, well, technically Jacob, but in English it's rendered James, was probably written by Jesus' half-brother, the leader of the early Christian church in Jerusalem. Paul's letters were often written to specific congregations with specific issues being addressed. However, this epistle seems to be a more general encouragement to all Christians. Jacob's main goal is not to correct misunderstandings or to teach theology. His book is not written for those who need to be convinced. Rather, it's addressed to Christians to spur them on to purposeful living. Jacob wastes no time launching right into countercultural and counterintuitive attitudes. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Trials are not something to avoid or bemoan, but they are a cause for rejoicing and a chance to live out faith. We should be steadfast not fickle or flighty. Jacob is very direct, like his in-your-face mirror analogy. Don't just listen to what God says, actually do it. Otherwise, you're like a fool who looks at himself in the mirror and then immediately forgets what he looks like. Instead, when sinning, we should do an about face because following Jesus' instructions are not just tasks or rules, it's about who we are. Our lives and the congregation's life together should embody the kind of community Jesus preached in places like the Sermon on the Mount, which this book often echoes. Jacob's attitude is, why settle for the cheap imitation of life that this world offers when we could aim for God's good, holy, and perfect plan? We're looking to the end, to the perfection that will come about at Christ's return. Armed with this sort of attitude, we can see setbacks and hardships as opportunities to demonstrate what faith can really look like. We should also love our neighbors as ourselves, not showing favoritism only to those who can help us. Wealth and prosperity typically make people treat you with more deference and you get more of what you want, but it shouldn't be that way in the church. James rips into churches that fawn over the rich because, he says, after all, it's often the rich who use their riches to take advantage of the church. He condemns riches that come from robbing laborers so that those in charge can live fat and sassy. In one paragraph alone in chapter 4, he condemns the riches for theft, fraud, callous indifference, and even murder. James doesn't coddle those still infatuated with the world. Laziness, for instance, should be rejected, and worldly comfort should be viewed with caution, if not suspicion. He refuses to acknowledge excuses. Don't blame God for your mistakes. The reason you sin is because you allow your desires to take control. God doesn't tempt you. Quite to the contrary, every good gift is from Him. Our hearts and passions are not trustworthy. Instead, they are what causes us to fight and quarrel so that we can get our way. We should resist the devil, and we need to run away from our own lusts. We are not naturally close to God, but we should, therefore, purposefully seek Him out through things like repentance, prayer, and pleading. We should be mourning over sin, not glorifying in it. The attitude Christians should embrace and nurture in ourselves is humility. Boasting about our accomplishments is silly, first of all, because we can't control the future. But secondly, it's an evil attempt to take personal credit for God's gifts. Instead of bragging, Paul universally encourages us to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. After all, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, but steadfast faith and lives do. Jacob has a lot to say about what we say. To put it provocatively, James is not a fan of free speech for Christians. Instead, the tongue needs to be tamed. He compares it to a wild beast or a wild fire. Left unchecked, it will do serious damage. Like a serpent's bite, our words can be filled with bitter and deadly poison. Again, we're employed not to forget our identity. Out of the same mouth we worship and bless the Lord, and the next minute we're bad-mouthing and cursing people, Jesus sought to seek and to save the lost. If he'd been seeking to condemn, the whole world would have been cursed. So don't act like children of the serpent who love to curse. Act like God's children who glory in God's grace and salvation. After all, mercy triumphs over judgment. Many of Jacob's proverbs echo the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. He embraces the same sorts of values Yahweh has always been championing. The point of life is not to make a big splash or to fight for your rights, it's to be faithful. Rather than stockpiling riches, we should use our materials to, for instance, look after orphans and widows. Our aspirations and dreams should not be for power or privilege, but to see God's kingdom come in our daily and simple interactions with those around. 
around us. He reiterates Jesus' teaching that the point of the law is to love your neighbor as yourself. He refuses to give any loopholes, pointing out that all our sins are contrary to God's will. He preaches accountability, and when we do sin, we shouldn't hide it or deny it. We should confess our sins to one another. Jacob talks about the interwoven nature of faith and works. Faith without works is an impossibility. If you have no mercy for a brother or sister in need, do you really care for them or the body of Christ? Something ain't right if you only care about the truth but are not moved by compassion. Taking God seriously also means waiting patiently for the Lord's return. We won't get everything we want now. Rather, we should be like the farmer waiting for the crops, fostering God's kingdom among us even if it takes a long time to produce. And we should put our hope in the Lord by responding to joys, troubles, and challenges in the same way, by prayer. Doing good works, despising the allure of riches, and a life of prayer are all faith exercises. They are a way we live out our faith, not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. In this way, our whole lives are a witness that God's kingdom is more important, true, and eternal than anything this world could offer.